just want to also add my welcome to uh, everything that Vic has said and also encourage you that if uh, we're looking to uh, bring a few people who have uh, tapped us elders on the shoulders and says, uh, I want to be baptized. I've been saved. I've not been baptized since my confession. We're looking to uh, hold a baptism service before the end of December, this side of Christmas. So if you have not been baptized and uh, you are looking to step out in that obedience, please come forward and grab one of the elders. We would love to sit down and talk with you. And if you're not sure uh, about it, you're not going to be reprimanded for, for asking it. If you've uh, put it off for a while, you're not going to be. You're going to be uh, whipped by at least two of the three elders. We've, we, you know, uh, but, but just reach out, have a conversation. We would love to see where you're at with the Lord, and maybe you're not even sure if you are fully saved. You're wondering whether you've placed your faith in Jesus truly. Well, we would love to have that conversation. Please reach out, or maybe you've got a friend that's brought you, a family member, or you're uh, close to one of the people who lead Bible studies or serve in other ways at church. Please talk. We would love to have that conversation. We're in Hebrews chapter two this morning, and I ask you to go there. This last uh, sermon has been a walk through the first and second chapter of Hebrews, all but the middle portion, which is what we're reading today. We've read the uh, first portion, that was chapter one, all about the full and unqualified divinity and deity and eternality of Jesus the Christ. He is God the Son, truly, truly God, holy and fully God. Chapter 2, verse 5 onwards, picked up and really made the case and the argument, again using Old Testament passages, and proving from the logic of what our salvation required, proving that Jesus is also at the same time, in, uh, in the same person and one subsistence, he has taken to himself an, a, a truly absolute human form, so that he's both God and he is man. This one unique occurrence in all of history, the God-man Jesus Christ. Still in that dual nature right now in heaven as our representative. And, and the writer of Hebrews, he, he sandwiches his application. He doesn't really use the Western sermonizing style of, this is true, this is true, this is true, therefore, at the end. Rather, he kind of sandwiches this, uh, the application and his exhortation for us in between these two main arguments about Jesus Christ before he begins the next section of the book. And that's what we read this morning. Uh, in between the whole of chapter two, uh, 1 and the, and the most of chapter 2 is the beginning of chapter 2. And that's really the, the meat to the sandwich, the application part of it. The exhortation that he makes is in light of all of this. Since Jesus is God and truly man, therefore do not tolerate the drifting away from Jesus Christ. He piles up all of these weighty truths about Jesus to then drive down into the ground for us a point of application. Therefore, do not drift. Before we read the book of Hebrews this morning, I want to read to you another ancient document, this one not inspired, written by an enemy of the church, his name Pliny the Younger. In uh, the early 100s, Pliny the Younger was a governor in Bithynia, in uh, Asia Minor, where there was much Christian mission and growth of the gospel in local churches. He was writing as a new governor, he was writing to the emperor Trajan. We have to feel for this guy. He's sort of come into office, and uh, on his first day in office, he opens up the manila folder, and here is just hundreds and hundreds of legal cases and accusations against this cultic group called the Christians. And he's not quite sure how to deal with them because they're, they're kind of kooky. Uh, some of them are rich and influential. Some of them are poor and slave people. Some of them are old. Some of them are young. Some of them have been in this, this, this group of theirs for for decades, some of them for only a few years. And, and here are all these accusations against them and, and requirements and requests of the, the local synagogues and, and of uh, other uh, lower magistrates requesting that they be thoroughly and bloodily dealt with. And Pliny the Younger is doing his best and he's been giving his, his uh, you know, he's given it a red hot crack at dealing with these, uh, these atheists they used to call Christians because they denied the hundreds of Roman gods and believed in only one God, man. They, they called that atheism. They, they would call them incests because they, they would uh, uh, call each other brother and sister, and you are only allowed to marry your sisters. Right? Do you see where they're getting that from? You're only supposed to marry other Christians. But to, but to the Romans, that sounded like incest. Not that Romans had a real problem with that, but it was, uh, it was a favorite pastime of many of their emperors. Nonetheless, it was weird. Uh, they, 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 they engaged in uh, cannibalism because they would all gather together and unbox some of their older brother's flesh and blood and eat it together. That's communion. 
He has all these misunderstandings of the world that are, that are really stirred up by the, the, the persecuting, unbelieving Jews, saying, get these guys out of our religion. They, they are blaspheming our God. And, and so it was uh, Pliny the Younger who, who was trying to sort through this act of justice and social order, and he writes to Trajan the emperor and says, I have never participated in trials of Christians before. We feel for him. I therefore do not know what offenses they are accused of and how to punish them. Uh, meanwhile, uh, uh, skipping down a bit, he says, also, in the case of those who are reported to me as Christians, I have observed the following procedure. So tra- here's what I've been doing. Let me know how I'm going. He says, here's what I do. I interrogate these people who are accused of being Christians as to whether they are. Those who confess that they were, I interrogate twice and then a third time, threatening them with punishment. Those who persist in their confession, I ordered executed. I do not know what they believe or the nature of their creed, but their stubbornness and inflexible obstinacy alone surely deserved to be punished. (laughs) There were others, of course, who possessed the same folly. But because they were Roman citizens, I could not kill them, but I sent them to Rome for trial. An anonymous document was published containing an accusation against many persons accusing them of being Christians. All those who denied that they were Christians, I freed. That is, those who invoked the name of the gods in a prayer repeating after me, denied themselves to be Christians, and offered prayer with incense and wine to your image, Caesar, which I had brought together with the statues of the gods. And moreover, as long as they cursed Christ, none of which, apparently, those who are really Christians are supposed to be able to do, then I freed them. They asserted, however, these Christians, that the sum and substance of all of their fault and crime is this. That is, that the Christians just said, all we're doing is, is the following. They meet together on a fixed day, that's Sunday, before dawn. You have a 10.30 service. You, 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 are you aware that there's a sunrise on a Sunday? It's the, they would gather before dawn on the Sunday. They would sing a hymn to Christ as if he were a god. They would commit themselves to not commit fraud, theft, or adultery. They would gather and then come again to take part in food, none of which I have heard is illegal food. Accordingly, I judged it all the more necessary to find out what the truth was by torturing two female slaves who were called deaconesses. But I discovered nothing else but depraved, excessive superstition. Okay, emperor worshipper. Excessive, depraved superstition. I therefore postponed the investigation and I hastened to write to you. For the matter seemed to me to warrant consulting you, especially because of the sheer number involved. For many persons of every age, of every rank, but also of both genders are endangered. For this contagion of superstition, that's his phrase, that's his nickname for the gospel. This contagion of superstition has spread not only to the cities, but also to the villages and farms. It seems, however, very possible. (laughs) It seems, however, very possible to check and stop the growth. (laughs) Which institution is dead in the crumbs and the dust of history? The Roman Empire or the Church of Jesus Christ? (laughs) Which has now been relegated to the depravity of of, uh, and contagion of excess superstition, Roman emperor worship or Jesus worship. Thank you very much, Pliny. Nonetheless, here's what Trajan said back, his response. Basically, he says, you're doing fine. Keep on doing what you're saying. His response includes this. Christians are not to be sought out. They would come at later emperors or other emperors like Nero would do so. But he says, don't seek out the Christians. But if they are denounced and it is proven that they are guilty, they are to be punished. With this one reservation, that whoever denies that he is a Christian and really proves it by worshipping our gods and claiming the lordship of Caesar, even though he was under suspicion in the past, he shall now obtain pardon through repentance. This is the kind of persecution concretely preserved for us in this letter exchange that was going on in the early generations of the church which presented to the early Christians, especially in the context of the book of Hebrews, especially the Hebrew Christians who had converted from their Old Testament faith in Yahweh, who had 
not in their mind left their old religion, but had fulfilled it by believing in the Christ, who had now started gathering on the Lord's day, taking communion, worshipping Jesus, doing all that, all that Pliny records that they have been doing. The unique temptation for them was that they would be found out, they would be dragged before a proconsul. If not a citizen, then they would be harshly treated, thrown in locks and chains, and then dragged out to some kind of public portrayal and display before a tribunal and, and the civilians. They would be thrown onto the block, and their options was this. You take up a portion of the incense, the Caesar worship incense. You touch it in the fire, you swing the smoke around, you pour the wine out, and you offer the one Roman confession. Kaiser Curios, Caesar is Lord. You show that you're a good Roman citizen, loyal to our gods above all else by worshipping the gods and offering incense at the image of Caesar. Then we will know you are not really a Christian, an atheist, an incestuous cannibalizer, one who worships this Jesus as God. And so we have three different options that were presented to the Christians. They would, they would be drawn up and, and dragged to that rock and uh, the, 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 that, that, that altar of human sacrifice where the blood of their own pastors and deaconesses litter the pavement and they would have the option. Option one is they obey as ordered. They, 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 they heed the authority of Caesar and his proconsuls and say, you told us to stop meeting, so we shall. You told us to stop worshiping Jesus, so we shall. I'm really banking here on the mercy of Jesus. I hope he'll get over this, but I'll confess Caesar is Lord and I'll shrink away into the civilians and worship Christ secretly in my heart. The other option was just as blasphemous. And it was to, amid your trial, reach in, which you've prepared with some foresight, reach into your back pocket of your shawl and pull out uh, a membership proof, a, a, a statement, a document of your, your belonging to the local Synagogue, not the church. Not oh, that rapscallion group of mongrels. No, no, I'm an upstanding member. My brothers and sisters and cousins will give a testimony to this. I belong to the local synagogue. I frequent the Jewish temple. Now, Roman proconsul, I may not be a Roman citizen, but the emperor has sealed in documents of the highest order that Jews worshipping Hebrews have religious freedom. It's the only religion in the old, in the old ancient empire that had religious freedom. And so here the Christian was able to, to deny Christ without having to say Caesar is Lord. They would deny Christ by professing Moses. They would leave the church, neglect the gathering of the church by sneaking back, shrinking within, and being overshadowed by the Christless Old Testament. Now, there is no such thing as a Christless Old Testament. There's no such thing as a Christless Mosaic religion. There's no such thing as a Christless Abrahamic religion. They all pointed to Jesus. So it was blasphemous just in a slightly sneakier way. Here's the third option. Here's the option the writer of the Hebrews calls them to live up to. And this is the phrase that he uses in Hebrews 10. He says, stand firm on the confession of our faith. In Romans 10, he says, we shall be saved. Those who say, not just with the secret shadows of their heart, but with your lips, declare that Christos is kurios. Christ is Lord. And with that, you seal your confession with blood. Your head rolls down the pavement and you're forgotten in some backwater letter of the governor to the emperor. But in heaven, you're immortalized. You're a martyr and you are ushered into the presence of Jesus Christ. This is the, the temptation, the scenery that we find ourselves in as we consider the ancient world. <coughs> the challenge of this book in Hebrews chapter 2 is this. But for those who, being dragged up to the human altar, decided in that moment to spare themselves a few extra years on this sin-cursed world by cursing Christ, I, we don't understand. Logically, we think through that. Who would even want to live here longer than Jesus wants you to? What a, what a waste of a, of, a, of a moment to give honor and glory to Christ, nonetheless. For those who did that, for those who rejected Jesus, cursed him, claimed Caesar's lordship, we are told in Hebrews, we are invited into this way of thinking that that moment of rejection was not merely a moment of rejection. Apostasy does not come upon a Christian so that they reject Jesus and fall away into the world and, and leave behind their confession. That does not come upon a Christian in a moment of overwhelming temptation, rather as a culmination of a secret 
committed lifestyle. That is to say simply this, no Christian walking with Christ, making good use of the means of grace by faith, in step with the Spirit, will be overcome by any temptation in the moment to reject Jesus and curse Him. Only those who have tolerated a drifting, who have in their heart thought small thoughts of Jesus, blasphemous thoughts of Jesus even, or at least just unimpressive affections of Jesus. They, they let him sort of you know, slide by the wayside, this, this commitment to Jesus. Only those who have done that are those who are found wanting in the moment of temptation and fail in the moment of trial and reject Jesus Christ. In the language of Hebrews 2, which we're going, going to read now, those who reject Jesus are those who have tolerated a shrinking or a drifting. A Christian cannot be overcome with apostasy at the end of a sword any more than an avid surfer can be overcome by a slow creeping tide. If an avid surfer drowns in the rising tide, it is because they ignored every warning sign. They did not tolerate, they did not listen to, they did not hearken, they did not beware. The flags, the, the moon shifting, the sun going down, the licking of the waves on their toes, the wetting of the sands, the, 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 the water that would now lick at their necks. If they stay on the sand to be drowned by a slowly rising tide, they are there by intent, they are there by neglect, and they are there by their own fault. It's not some tsunami that took them, they, they just lay there. That's what apostasy is for a Christian. There is no, no one who who walking in faith to Jesus Christ, who are keeping in step with the Spirit, will be overwhelmed in a moment to throw him by the wayside and disregard him. So the warnings of Hebrews 2 read like this, chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience, received a just retribution. How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by our Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard, while God also bore witnesses by signs and wonders and various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to His will. May God bless this word in our midst this morning. You hear it right there, don't you? The two themes of being tethered to, staying close to, and the parallel theme of drifting, floating away. Do not flirt with the idea of cursing the name of the Son of God, he's saying. Do not tolerate. Give no quarter or mercy. Give no area of the field to those inward affections or temptations that would tolerate the idea of for the sake of saving your life, you would throw Christ by the wayside. The language of this four verse section then is this, do not drift. Do not drift. We could ask a very simple, it's not a trick question, don't, don't get too convoluted. How much effort does a boat, a vessel, in a, in a lake, in a river, in a bay, how much effort, how much manpower, how many of the, of the sailors, to what degree does the engine have to work? What tools have to be employed? How much work is it for that boat to simply drift along with the current of its surroundings? Of course, the answer is absolutely none. Nothing, nothing, nothing is required for a boat to go with the current other than exist. It simply sits there, the current carries it, pushes it upon, and as long as that boat does nothing, it will drift perfectly. It will be at peace with its surroundings. It will, uh, it will be a, a going according to the, the path and, the, and the, the, the channels and the, the currents of the world. But for that thing, for that boat to be steadfast, if it needs to be kept from drifting, only one simple thing is needed. Anybody who's... who's had a dad with a boat, an uncle with a boat. Maybe you just watch, you watch a movie with a boat. And you know that really all they do is they either throw down an anchor or they tether that boat to the jetty. They, they have a mooring. They have a rope, a, a chain of some kind, which tethers that rope to the shore to keep them from drifting. You don't actually need to keep your engine running. You don't need to keep on rowing. All you need is a stationary, steadfast, solid connection, a tethering of the boat to the land, to the jetty, to the port. And this is what the writer of the Hebrews is telling us. Do 
not drift. You can't, you can't involve, uh, uh, you can't control rather the current of the world. You can't control how fast it comes upon you. You can't control how, how constantly it pushes against you. You can't control that, but you can. You do. You must control the degree to which you as a soul is tethered to the ground of Jesus Christ, to the port of Jesus Christ. The language here in chapter two of the book of Hebrews is we must pay much closer attention, to pay attention. Some of your versions might say to take heed. One of the original uses of that Greek phrase under that English wording is one of, one of actually tethering, of, of coming into port and tying that ship up to the jetty. And then he'll then go and say, we must pay us closer attention lest we drift. So, so this is the mental, mental image that, that the writer has, is that we will, we will flow along with the world and drift to our own destruction if we are not tethered, tethered, tethered firmly and fastly. So he says, pay much closer attention. That paying attention is the tethering, that keeping an eye on, that taking heed, that is the tethering of your soul to the ground so that we do not drift, so that when persecution comes upon you, you do not reject Christ outright, or so that as sin's claws slowly claw at you through life, as the weeds of sin slowly grow up around your boots, as the slow oxidizing effect of the rusting environment we find ourselves in. Maybe we have outright moments of temptation to reject Jesus with at the sword's point. Or, or maybe, more commonly, it's simply that the ways of the world are slowly lapping at the outside of the vessel. How do we keep in both moments our souls tethered so that we do not drift we pay close attention. We keep our eyes on Jesus. This is, the, this is the amazing encouragement that there is in this verse. Though, though it starts out with this intense warning, pay closer attention. The old covenant, they died. They were sometimes stoned. You would get whipped. You would, get, you would have your belongings ripped off of you. Your wife would be a widow because you, you lied in the temple. Oh, all these terrible things would happen in the law. Yes, terrible. But what we have in Jesus Christ is not merely a, a large blank check. It is greater mercy. It is more wonderful grace from God delivered through his son. So we should probably think that actually, and as Hebrews says, we ought to think that in the new covenant age, there is greater wrath stored up for those who are enemies and rejectors and deniers of the gospel than there are those who merely broke Moses' law. So here's the warning. Do not drift. Fear. Run from. The idea even uses this harrowing language. How will we escape? God's justice, if you reject and deny his son, will chase you, will find you much, much more effectively than some pagan emperor will find Christians in his kingdom. The, the Lord of hosts will find the enemies and the rejectors of his son. He will find, how can we escape the absolute wrath that will come upon those who reject the gospel, deny it, or even receive it for a time, then throw it away in the moments of inconvenience or in persecution? It starts with quite a heavy, I hope we can feel that, a heavy Warning falling upon us. The encouragement, of course, is what it is that he tells us you need to do in order to not drift. In order to escape that punishment, how much more would the wrath of God be? The, the solution, the what you need to do, what the, you and I need to be found doing is actually rather simple. All he says is not that you need to come and bring a sacrifice worthy. You need to make sure you are giving enough to Jesus and the church, uh, you need to make sure that you've put in enough effort, right? The, the version of you in the future who is loving Jesus on your deathbed and about to tip over into heaven, that version of you decades from now, that version of you has not persevered in the Christian walk because you complemented and supplemented Christ's finished work with your own deeds. You don't make it to the end because you, getting busy with your hands, found ways to keep, keep God pleased with you and you, you manage to convince God to leave his spirit within you. That's not why we make it. That's not how Christians persevere. Christians persevere to the end because they kept their mind set on Christ. As heavy as this warning is, do not drift. The, the application is, is very difficult in a world, in a body of sin, but it is also gloriously simple. And it is the same 
same commandment that Jesus always makes to us. Your, your absolute most important command from God right now is trust upon Jesus Christ, who did everything for you, who finished the work for you, who is the foundation and the perfection, the finishing of your faith. Christians, the way we persevere is by keeping our minds set on Jesus. That's the tethering. That is the rope that joins the vessel to the land. Do not drift. You see how he compares things here, though? Look in verse, verse 1. He says, therefore, we must, we must pay. He doesn't just say we must pay close attention. He says relatively or comparatively, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard. Now, what we have heard is the gospel, the message of Jesus, the truths about Christ that he has been talking about in this book. He says we must pay, we must pay much closer attention. Must, much, much closer attention than what? The astounding reality of what he's talking about. The, the whole theme of the book of Hebrews is much closer attention than you ever paid to Moses' law, to Abraham's religion, to the temple teaching, to the Levite sacrifices. Much closer attention to Jesus than those things. And we might be tempted to think that he's here deriding or, or throwing away or chopping down the glory of the old covenant. And say, God, stop, you, you were wrong to ever pay attention to that. That Moses, that Abraham, that David, throw it away. Look to Jesus. He doesn't. He makes an argument from the lesser to the greater. He said, it's good that you paid much attention to the system which would give a just retribution if you sinned against it. It's good that you paid attention to the Mosaic, Abrahamic, Davidic system and covenants. That's good. You must. But if you, any argument you can make for listening to the old covenant, you can make infinitely more to looking and listening to Jesus. That's his, that's his gr lesser to the greater logical argument. If it's good to listen to the prophets of old, it's infinitely better to listen to the greatest prophet, Jesus. If it was good to, to hearken to the sacrifices of the Levitical priests, it is infinitely more important to hearken to the sacrifice of the greatest priest, Jesus Christ. If it was important to, to be obedient to and honor the kings God gave you back then, it is infinitely more important to hearken to the authority and give honor to the one true king, Jesus Christ. So this is the, the argumentation of these, these simple verses. Do not drift. How do we not drift? By looking at, by taking heed of, by paying attention to all that Jesus is for us in his threefold office of the great prophet, the great priest, and the great king. Look back at the beginning of, of the book of Hebrews into chapter one. At this point, we're sort of re-going re over these, these themes that have been uh, theological uh, 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 points made by uh, much of the church, especially since the Reformation which is that we can look at the Old Testament and see that God utilized the prophets to speak, the priests to make sacrifices, and the kings to rule over God's people. And something that the, the theologians noticed in the New Testament is that these three things, which are usually uh, uh, fulfilled by distinct individuals at each time throughout the Old Covenant, they're actually, they're all coalescing in. All of these hats are worn. All of these uniforms are worn by Jesus Christ in the one self-same person. And so we're going to look at that, how it shows to us in Hebrews 1 that he is both our prophet, our priest, and he is also our king. Back in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, what the writer of the Hebrews said, remember all of this is an argument from the lesser to the greater. The lesser glorious old covenant, though glorious, points us to the greater glory of Jesus Christ. Therefore, pay attention. Chapter 1, verse 1 says, Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers, by the prophets. And right there, it's where the Hebrew wants to jump up and down and say, exactly, the old covenant, it's spoken by God through prophets. Let's go back to it. We don't die there. Let's go back. But the writer of the Hebrews one-ups the whole thing. Yes, it's wonderful to listen to the prophets. But verse 2 says, but in these last days, more recent, he has spoken to us more personal by his son. It's actually he himself. So, of course, if, if listening to a prophet of God is important to you, O Hebrew Christian, then listening to Jesus must be considered by you of the absolute utmost importance. If you would not 
simply turn, a, t- turn an ear, turn, uh, turn away, turn your back on uh, Isaiah as he's waxing eloquent on the sins of Israel and how to be found in God's salvation. If you would not turn away from that scoffer and leave him behind on a street corner, then you must not do the same to Jesus. He's the more glorious divine prophet sent from heaven. In chapter 2, verse 3, which we read just before, he's talking about the gospel and says, it was declared at first by the Lord. Right? Jesus was a parapetetic teacher, just like many of the Old Testament prophets. That is that he would walk around, get to a place, a hillside, a synagogue, a home, and he would just start preaching. Then he would move along to the next one. He, would start, he was an Old Testament prophet. He was a preacher, and he preached the gospel. And as such... He ought to be heard above every Old Testament prophet. Ultimately, because God bore witness to him in greater measure than he bore witness to any Old Testament prophet. Look at the rest of chapter 2, verse 3, going into 4. It says, while God also bore witness. God bore witness. Just as the prophets of old had angelic visitations or visions, or sometimes they were enabled to do or see something miraculous occur, and this was supposed to be Israel's sign, the prophet is sent from God, listen to him, so much more. In almost immeasurable, it's almost impossible to put into words the degree of miracles that Jesus did. John the Apostle says in his gospel, if I wrote down all the miracles that just I saw, there's not a library in the whole Roman Empire that could hold all of the scrolls necessary. It is an innumerable amount of miracles just constantly pouring out of his fingertips and mouth every day that he was doing his public ministry. It was unstoppable. It was glorious. It was amazing. It was nothing like any of the other prophets. And and the voice also bore witness from heaven at different points in Jesus' life. The voice of the Father saying, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. Or this is my son, listen to him. That's the point. The miracles of Jesus were God's affirmation over Jesus' message. He is the greatest prophet. God bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and in the church, then by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. These are a proof that Jesus, the speaker of all these things, (coughs) the first preacher of the gospel is a prophet sent from God. What's the application? So do not drift from his message. Or we can also see that Jesus is the priest. Look at chapter 1, verse 3. Down at the last sentence of the verse. He says, After making purification for sins, he sat down. Now this is why. There's no priest of the thousands that, 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 that serve, the, the hundreds of high priests, the, the tens of thousands of Levites that were throughout the whole nation not one of them could say in an unqualified sense, hey, darling, how was, your work, how was your day at work today? Great, darling, I made purification for sins. Because if that was true, if he could just throw that out of, out of his mouth and it be unqualifiedly true, then she would say, great, you've hit retirement. Because your whole job is continually making purification for sins. Can't even say that's that quick. If you did it yesterday, if you did it today at work, then there's, there's no work left, Right? Now, every priest had to keep on going back to the offering, back to the altar, back to the sacrifices, back to the temple, because none of them really made purification for sins. They purified for a time, a few people under the ceremonial system, but no one's soul was cleansed by the blood of a bull or a goat. Jesus, though, the writer of the Hebrews tells us, made purifications for sins in one act, and what did he do? He kicked his feet up. He sat down. Because he's done. How frustrating would it be to, to, be a, to be a Levite? You can sort of see the spiritual things going on and just see Jesus go as a priest, do one thing and then leave. And go, done. I'm finished. I'm not butchering animals all day. I'm not carrying flesh upon the altar. I'm done. One act of righteousness, of sacrifice and death in blood. I'm done. Purification for sins. Entirely made in a way that is mind-blowing for the cyclical nature of the Old Testament sacrifices. And so, chapter 2, verse 17 says, that after becoming like us in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, he made propitiation for the sins of the people. That is, he, he satisfied God's wrath, 
He fulfilled the needs of the law. Jesus is our great high priest. And lastly, lastly, in this theme of Hebrews telling us, do not drift. How do we not drift? How do we, how do we not fail bit by bit? How do we not incrementally drift from Jesus and be found to be swept out to sea or upon the rocks or out into the river rapids? How? You pay attention, you set your mind, you worship, you place your affections, you think frequently about, you worship Jesus the way the Bible presents him to us in his threefold glorious divine man offices. And the last one to do that in is the language or the idea of king. Jesus is the ultimate king. Back in chapter one, verse three, we do see it said that after making purifications for sins, he sat down. Where did he sit down? Where did he take his sabbatical rest after making purification for sins? He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. That's Old Testament language for sitting on the throne over the entire universe. He is now Lord of Lords. He is now King of Kings. He is King. He is ruling. He is he is also, as chapter 2 told us of Hebrews, uh, he is the perfect fulfillment of chapter 2 verse 7 in the book of Psalms which was prophesying a, a king that would come and inherit all of the nations. Now, when that prophecy was spoken, it had partial application to Solomon. And Solomon was told, ask of Yahweh, and he will go before you, and he will give to you all of the nations. And contextually, the meaning was that all the nations around them, all the surrounding countries, all of the enemies he knew of could be overcome by his faith in God and his prayer for God to make good on his covenant. Nowhere, nowhere in the old covenant was there this idea that Solomon was meant to rule the planet. Every land, the Antipodes on the other side of this, this globe, and, and any other planet that, that, that futuristic uh, uh, businessmen decide to colonize, and every nation with every language you've never heard of. That wasn't the idea of Solomon's kingdom. It spoke to a much greater, a much higher king who would come in the person of Jesus and of him it is said he takes inheritance over all the nations. Or as Hebrews chapter 2 verse 9 tells us, he is crowned with glory and honor. As verse 7 tells us, he has all things placed under his feet in subjection and in service to him. In Luke chapter 11 verse 20, Jesus, speaking of his miracles, made a logical biblical argument to his detractors. And he told them, if by the Spirit of God, by the finger of God, I am casting out demons, then you know that the kingdom of God has come upon you. Yeah. Multiple choice question for all the Christians in the room today. Did Jesus cast out demons by the power of Satan or by the finger of God? The finger of God. You could have been more confident on that. Meaning, absolute logic out of the mouth of Jesus himself. The kingdom of God has arrived. And they might look around, where? Where's the walls? Where's the gold? Where's the crown? Where's the angels? Jesus says, no, no, no. The kingdom is where the king is. And you're looking at him. I am the king, he said uh, in the beginning of Mark chapter 1. The time is at hand. The kingdom of God has come. It is at hand. It was what he was to bring. And so Psalm 8 speaks and Hebrews 2 says that he has been crowned with glory and honor. All of this is to say that, that for those tempted to go back to Hebrew religion to escape the obligations to worship Jesus, Hebrews is saying, you don't understand anything that the old covenant says. The old covenant bears witness to Jesus as the ultimate prophet, the ultimate priest and the ultimate glorious reigning king. Jesus is God. Jesus became man so that he might be able to make a sacrifice for our sins and bring many people into the kingdom of God, into salvation, into the grace of his father. I wonder, have you, have you taken up that grace? Have you received that grace into your own soul? Have you been washed of sin by the priest's sacrifice? Have you come into the kingdom of God by bending the knee and confessing, Christ is Lord, not Caesar, not myself. Have you heard the word of the great prophet who speaks to you from heaven? It says, repent of your sins. And there's only one way to heaven and it's through me, not your own efforts. Have you done this? Have you received the word of this Jesus, the good news of the gospel? There, there is a, a warning still latent in this passage, which 
which, which hearkens to warn you, which should wake you up if, if you think of it. No, no, not yet. No, not Jesus for me yet. He's interesting. I, I tell you, he's a real chap. What a, what a, what a, what a, what a marvelous, uh, uh, enigmatic, uh, uh, beautiful historical figure he is. And, and I'm glad that he can uh, uh, have relevant teachings for us today. And I appreciate what you're all doing here, this whole, this whole church thing. I think it's good for the nation. I think it's good for society. And, and I'll, I'll think about Jesus. I've even heard one foolish pastor say, if you don't want to become a Christian, at least give Jesus a 30-day free trial of your life. Yeah, correct response. Yeah, so Trial him out for 30 days as Lord, and then maybe just send him back to the returns if you're not happy. That's not the atmosphere, the, the spirit with which this passage presents Jesus to us. It says, if angels start fires on mountains that make earthquakes look like ripples, if angels deliver laws that massacre people in their tens of thousands for their blasphemy, old covenant, go read your Bible, if that makes you shiver a little, don't even begin to think about the possibility of escape of outrunning the sword of God's justice when it is found out on your dying day that you to your dying breath rejected God's son on the cross and glorious from the grave. Don't tolerate the thought of dying without Jesus. Embrace him today. If you're a Christian, we come to this, I suppose it's quite a strategic, a providential sort of time that we're coming to the back end of the year. And you can just compare yourself to maybe this time on the eve of Christmas last year. This time at the end of, end of 2023, where were you? How were you? As, as you just sort of take that 12-month that comparison. How, it's horrible to do day-by-day's comparison. As a Christian, you'll just hate yourself forever. But, but this is quite strategic. This is, this is helpful and practical. How was I a year ago? Has, has my attendance to the gathering increased? Have I, have I been speaking more of Jesus to my loved ones? Do I understand more of his words spoken by the Holy Spirit in the Bible? Do I, do I commit and serve the body more? Am I, am I more stirred in my affections toward Jesus? Am I, am I, am I more regular in my, in my obedience to him? Is my sin, though still present, copping some black eyes? Am I, am I walking in victory over some of these patterns that used to hold me down? How has the last year been for you? Have you, have you drifted? Has the tethering begun to wane and lengthen as, you, as you're drawn down the currents of the river. Where are you? Of just the ordinary, understandable, I totally get it, but the claws of the world, the organizing and the balancing of the budget, the, the, the new job, the, the family is growing, have just all these ordinary things clouded out Jesus for you. How ordinary and how often, how frequent it is that these things happen to Christians. Here's the good news. We have a high priest who is merciful and faithful. Where you and I have failed, he never drifted. Where you and I need grace, he welcomes us in and says that's all he's got to give. So this end of the year, let's give our sin to Jesus. Let's request that he would stir us up more and more to love and good works. Let's pray. Father God, we ask that in your mercy and in your grace, you would in this moment right now send fleeing all of the lies, the temptations, the, the currents, the philosophies, the, the, the guilt that would hold anybody back in this very moment from committing their life, their soul to Jesus Christ entirely. Anything that would, that would hold somebody back from throwing themselves to Jesus' mercy and begging for his grace and confessing that he is Christ over all other beings and entities and over themselves. Anything that would hold them back from that, Lord God, please cut, please, please give them new, new hearts, new faith, give them new life, purify them of sins, bring them unto Jesus so that he might be their king. We pray, Lord God, that you would save people in this way, in this very moment. We also ask, Lord God, that those who are your people, that you would stir in us such a heart, a zeal, a courage, and a boldness that we would not drift. We would not simply cross our fingers and hope that in the day of trial we will be fine, but that we would be putting in those daily, weekly, continual disciplines to push closer to Jesus, knowing that it is not a burdensome task. You diligently, you, you, you marvelously reward those who diligently seek you. 
Pray, Lord God, that you would stir this in us so that we are more Christ-like and, and more obsessed with everything Jesus is for us in the Scriptures. Lord Jesus, we love you. We do adore you. May all glory go to you. And may you be pleased to receive our worship in this gathering. For it is through your name that we pray. And everybody said...